all you know about seals is that they're furry, flippered, and their breath smells like fish, there's a lot more to find out about these fascinating marine mammals. In this video, I'll be introducing you to my work on these members of the pinniped family. You'll learn what that term means, how we get an idea of what they do in their private lives, the difference between a seal and a sea lion, and the math of how the GPS works in your phone or car or on a tag seal. I'm Monica DeAngelis. I'm a marine mammal biologist with the U.S. Navy based in Newport, Rhode Island, and I've been doing a lot of research into harbor seal migrations here on the East Coast, including tracking them with the help of satellites. I'm excited to tell you all about it, but first let me introduce myself and tell you how I got to partner with the Navy to study our furry ocean friends. I grew up right here in Newport, Rhode Island. It's surrounded by water, so I've loved the sea my whole life. Seeing it, hearing it, smelling the salt air, even back in high school, I knew I wanted to be out there, around it, not in an office job where I sat indoors all the time. But my biggest inspiration in high school came a little ways up north in Massachusetts. We took a field trip there to see humpback whales. I was blown away by the experience. They were so close to shore, it made me realize how intimately connected we are with the marine ecosystem. Marine mammals weren't something that only existed far away out at sea or on remote islands where the only people who saw them were whalers and sealers back in the olden days. They're actually all around us. So I stayed interested in ecology and zoology all through high school and college. I'm not gonna lie, math wasn't exactly my favorite subject in high school. But right from my first job, math was super involved. I started figuring out gray whale migrations out on the west coast. So it was clear how important and relevant all my high school math and science preparation was. And it remained so as my interest branched out to the migrations of other oceanic mammals, like seals. They're so cute and funny looking, how could I not fall in love with them? And thanks to the Navy recruiting me to study them, those lovable fuzzballs eventually brought me right back home to Rhode Island. Now I use the latest technology to find out some really interesting things about how and where they move around, literally hundreds of miles, and what they get into while they do it. Today, we're at the New Bedford Whaling Museum in Massachusetts. Through our educational partnership, the Navy has collaborated with the museum on several marine mammal exhibits here, including the ones you see behind me. And nearby is the Newark Newport Research Facility, where my group performs basic research on marine mammals for the Navy. Basic research means we try to learn more about the lives and essential activities of wild ocean animals, like seals. We might think we already know all about them by now, but we don't. There's still a lot to learn, especially about how these mammals fit into the wider marine ecosystem, which includes us. I'm really happy that the Navy is helping to make it possible for us to find out more about what makes these fascinating creatures tick. When I say us, I'm referring to a team made up of all kinds of skills and specialties. Everyone brings something a little different to the table. We have hands-on experts from electrical engineers to ecologists. And remember how I said math wasn't my favorite subject? I'm fortunate to be able to call in some high-powered math expertise from our in-house mathematicians and statisticians. I was out in San Diego when I first got interested in what we call pinnipeds. Pinniped just literally means wing or fin-footed. It's the group of flipper-footed aquatic mammals that includes seals, sea lions, and walruses. Fun fact. Want to be able to tell the difference between a seal and a sea lion? One way is that sea lions have big flippers and can kind of walk on them on land, while seals have small flippers and wriggle on their bellies on land. Also, sea lions have little shrek ears, while seals don't. Anyway, I started studying harbor seals specifically. In some ways, pinnipeds aren't the most popular kids in the marine mammal lunchroom, compared to all the love the whales and dolphins get but I developed quite a soft spot for them. They're a lot like dogs in some ways, so they're quite relatable to people, and they hang out right on shore so they can be easier for us to study. That's especially good because things we find out about pinnipeds might be able to be translated to the other marine mammals as well. Once I started looking at harbor seals, I noticed that their territorial range on the east coast was expanding. 
That means that the area they roam around was getting bigger. I found that intriguing. It wasn't necessarily something I was expecting, so I decided to try and find out more. The coastal area is absolutely critical for humans. We use it for lots of different activities. Think about all the goods that come in or out by ship, or all the construction we do of things like piers at the ocean's edge, or the patrols the Navy and Coast Guard do to keep us safe. If we learn more about why the seals' patterns and habits are changing, that could help us flag potential issues before they become real problems to ensure that we are responsible caretakers of the coastal environment. Things like range expansion are important because once we dig into it, changes in the territory a group of animals occupies could signify all kinds of things we ought to know about. Is something changing about the environment, like the food supply or the climate? Or are there other potential issues approaching down the road that we could avoid if we were better informed? To figure out the answers to these questions, we're going to need a lot of science and technology knowledge, skills, and equipment. Our team has all the marine biology, ecology, engineering, and math chops I mentioned before to be able to understand everything we're looking at. But the real game changer has been the access we now have to electronic sensors down here on Earth and satellite networks up there in space that allow us to collect the data in the first place. In past years, to monitor the movements of animals, scientists basically had to watch for them and rely on direct observations. It took lots of time and was hard to get detailed information because if you didn't find them, you found out nothing. But thanks to advances in electronics miniaturization, satellite communications, and the support of the Navy, we can have the animals carry a high-tech tracking package with them that reports back everything they're up to. The key technology we use for tracking wild seals is a smart electronic tag. We have a couple of different tags, like this one and this one, which differ in some capabilities and cost. The tags are basically little battery-powered data loggers for tracking the vertical and horizontal movements of the seals 24-7. They use GPS to plot the seal's location when it's on the surface, just like the navigation system in your phone. And every so often, the data collected in the tags are beamed to a satellite passing overhead, and the data dump is passed along to us. This one is kind of the deluxe model, the FastLoke GPS tag. It can really tell us a lot in addition to GPS location. It records depth, temperature, light, and whether it's wet or dry, so we know if the seal is in water or on land. So we can use this information to generate detailed dive profiles. It also stores the locations of the Argos satellites, which is a network of satellites put in space to help with oceanographic data collection. This lets the tag know where and when to upload the data packet. Since water blocks radio waves and the tag has a low power transmitter to conserve battery life, satellite communications can only happen when the tag is on the surface and has a clear line of sight to the satellite unobstructed by cloud cover. If it can't talk to the satellite, it needs to chill for a bit and keep storing the data until it gets a chance to send it. Speaking of battery life, it's designed to last about a year, which matches the time between the seal molting its fur, which they do every year. Just like we stop wearing sweaters when it gets warm, harbor seals in New England molt in summer. So we like to go out and tag them when their fur is fresh in the fall to maximize data collection. We want to be sure to attach the tag in a way that doesn't harm or bother the seal in any way. So we actually glue the tag to the seal's back fur with epoxy. That way, it'll just fall off in a year's time when the seal molts naturally and the seal pretty much ignores it while it's there. Whether the battery lasts that long depends on how many times it has to try to transmit its data. But if it sends us information from November to July, then I'm really happy. You might be wondering how the GPS in this little tag actually works. For that matter, how does it work in your phone or your car's navigation system? They all work the same way, using radio signals and the branch of math called geometry. The reason that something as small as a phone or a tag can use GPS is because they're only receivers. All they have to do is listen for radio signals, not broadcast them, which would take much more power. GPS is the latest and greatest form of what we call radio navigation. 
but the concept has been around for a long time. It just used to use fixed transmitters on land. So to keep things simple, let's start off with how that used to work in two dimensions. Imagine that a receiver, like our phone, wants to know where it is relative to two land-based transmitters that send out a radio signal at exactly the same time. Radio signals travel at the speed of light, so unless we're exactly along the center baseline, equidistant from the two transmitters, one signal will arrive at the receiver very slightly earlier than the other one. If all we know is the time difference of the arrival of the two signals, we can make a graph of all the possible positions we could be where it would see that time difference. For two transmitters, that graph is something called a hyperbolic curve. And like any continuous curve, there are infinite positions the receiver could be along it. But we wanna know exactly where we are. And even with only two transmitters, we can know a lot more about our location if we know the time the signal was sent. Then we can work out our positions based on circular geometry. The time it took us to receive the signal from the first transmitter lets us know we're somewhere on a circle around it, where the distance we are away is the radius of that circle, which is the elapsed time since the signal was sent multiplied by the speed of light. If we then perform the same calculation on the second signal, we've immediately narrowed down our location to two points, the places where those two circles intersect, just from one signal sent by each of two transmitters. That might already be enough to pinpoint ourselves because we might already have some information about which side of the transmitters we're on. But in case we don't, we can resolve it with a third transmitter. Now we have three intersecting circles, all three of which can only meet at just one place. This is the situation in two dimensions, when all the transmitters and the receiver are on a plane. But we live in three dimensions, so what if we push those transmitters up into space? Now those circles become spheres and we have the GPS system. Just as we used the distance the signal traveled as the radius of the circles in two dimensions, now in three dimensions, that distance is the radius of a sphere centered on each satellite. Remember that to do this math with just the radius, we need to have all the clocks synchronized so we know the time difference between when the signal was sent and when we received it. So the GPS signals actually contain information about the satellite's position and the time the signal was sent so the receiver can synchronize its clock to the clocks on the satellites. Pretty clever. Just like we needed three transmitters to make sure we could identify our location where three circles meet, we need to be able to hear from four GPS satellites to find ourselves where the spheres meet. Two spheres intersect in a circle, three spheres intersect at two points, and four spheres pinpoint us exactly. In practice though, we can make a rough estimate using just three satellites. Can you figure out why? Where might we get a fourth sphere from? That's right, we're sitting on one. The Earth is roughly a sphere, and we can assume that we're on the surface of it. This isn't quite right where the Earth is deformed from spherical, like up on a mountain, but it's not too bad where it's pretty flat, like for a seal on the surface of the ocean. It does get a bit more complicated than this, because the satellites are not sitting still. They're orbiting the Earth at high speed. So we have to do some corrections for their movement. But at the end of the day, it's all math. Pretty amazing what that can do for us. So what has all this math and space, radio, and electronics helped us find out about the harbor seals? We know that they cover huge amounts of territory. Even 800 mile swims from Virginia to Maine have been demonstrated. And the best news is that we think we figured out why, and it's for a good reason. We believe they're expanding their range to reclaim territory they lost in the past due to unsustainable human behavior that's now improving. Seals in New England were at one point nearly hunted to extinction, but now thanks to the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972, they are reestablished and thriving. We've done other research activities to fill in the picture that the tracking has sketched out for us, even inspecting their poop to see what they've been eating. And I'm happy to tell you 
that they've been enjoying a diet of good quality fish near their haul out sites. So there's no sign of food shortage making them venture out farther. In fact, we can see that as we do a better job of managing the coastal ecology, the inhabitants are thriving as a result. This is why we do basic research, gaining knowledge for the sake of knowledge, to get this kind of feedback on the things we've been doing to better look after the environment. It's amazing to me that the satellite technology we have now can do so much more than help us navigate around cities and highways. It can help us make sure we're doing a responsible job looking after our oceans. I wonder what my high school self would have imagined was possible to do with it. Can you think of ways you could use GPS and sensing to figure out more about your local environment and how it's being managed? But one thing's for sure, I don't have to wonder what high school me would have thought about what I'm doing now. She'd be thrilled to see how the Navy has supported me performing the job out in the field that I've always dreamed of doing, hands-on zoology and ecology and getting to interact closely with these cute little goofballs. Knowing that the scientific research I'm doing will help keep the coastal environment where I grew up on the path to better and better ecologic health makes me feel just about as warm and fuzzy as these seals.